Hey everyone, it's Mr. Bebe, and this lesson is on viral structure and reproduction. So let's get right into it with our first key concept. Viruses come in many shapes and reproduce in different ways. So let's look at the structure of a virus first. Now, the one we have here is called a bacteriophage, uh, but what I want to point out is that all viruses have a couple of things in common. So all viruses have genetic material, either in the form of DNA or RNA. Now, it can be double-stranded or single-stranded. And all viruses also have a capsid or protein coat that encases that genetic material. Now, some viruses, not all viruses, are going to have a tail sheath, tail fibers, or even something called a lipid envelope that is another layer that of protection made of lipids. So in this case, like a bacteriophage will have a tail sheath and tail fibers, whereas other viruses do not. So virus specificity. Now, this means that certain viruses only infect certain organisms or certain types of cells. Like, for example, there may be viruses that only affect plants and not other organisms. There may be ones that affect only bacteria. Uh, there are even certain viruses that are specific to a cell type, like this one that infects epithelial cells. And then there's even viruses that we don't know their exact specificity or kind of how they act because maybe they infect multiple different types of cells or multiple different organisms. So let's talk about the reproduction of a virus because there's two life cycles that are really, really important. So you have a lytic cycle and you have a lysogenic cycle. Now viruses cannot re reproduce on their own, so they have to infect a host cell in order to carry out their life cycle. So they basically infect the cell and then use the cell as an assembly line to make more viruses. But these two different life cycles are extremely different. So let's look at the first one, which is the lytic cycle. Now you see in this graphic here, you have the steps all around, starting from the top left and going clockwise. So what the virus does is it attaches to the host cell and then it injects its DNA or genetic material, it could be RNA, into that host cell. What happens is the host cell's DNA gets destroyed and the viral DNA is the only DNA that's left. Now what happens is the viral parts are now assembled into new viruses and the host cell uh, bursts or goes through lysis uh, to form uh, all these new viruses that, that can then go out and infect a bunch of other cells. So that's why it's called the lytic cycle because lysis is going to occur. So basically what happens is that virus takes over that cell and that cell becomes a little virus producing factory. Now this is very different from the lysogenic cycle which the first two steps are, are just the same as the lytic cycle. The virus attaches and the virus injects its genetic material. Same as lytic cycle but here's where the difference comes in step three. That viral DNA actually uh, called the prophage it combines with the host cells DNA and it just kind of becomes part of that DNA and as the cell replicates itself it actually keeps copying that viral DNA um, but that viral DNA just stays inactive so again that viral DNA is replicated along with the host cell DNA and before you know it you've got cell division taking place and you got lots and lots and lots of copies of this cell with that inactive viral DNA still in there now that lysogenic stays dormant. So some way you can remember it is lysogenic lies so still. It's just waiting. So usually when you're infected with a, a, a virus and it's in its lysogenic cycle, you're not really going to see any symptoms or anything like that because it's remaining inactive. But something can happen uh, at any time to activate that uh, DNA, that prophage that's in there. And once the uh, uh, DNA or RNA gets activated, it enters the lytic cycle, which is the infective cycle. So that's the difference between the lytic and the lysogenic cycle there. So let's look at a couple of different types of viruses. First, we look at the influenza virus or the flu virus. This is uh, of the family ortho, uh, orthomyxovirus. Now, um, it's an RNA virus, meaning RNA is its genetic material. Um, it infects your respiratory system, either getting in through your nose or throat and then kind of settles in your lungs. Most people have had the flu at some point, but you can see, look, it's a round virus. It's got RNA segments. It's got a capsid, and it also has a lipid envelope. Remember I said some viruses have those. Now, how do you get the flu? It's usually by droplet transmission from coughs or secretion, like somebody uh, wipes their nose and touches something, and then you also touch that or they sneeze or they cough and those droplets get airborne and um, people breathe those in. So that's kind of how flu transmission happens and it happens very, very quickly because it's pretty virulent. 
Um, so now let's talk about retroviruses, because I talked about the flu virus, which uh, has RNA as its genetic material. There are very few types of uh, flu that are actually retroviruses. So let's talk about this here. A retrovirus specifically has RNA as its genetic material. You don't have any retroviruses that have DNA as their genetic material. Because what they do is they use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to make DNA from their RNA. So they reverse the process. So remember uh, back when we first started biology, we learned that DNA is transcribed into RNA and then the RNA is then made into protein. So you use lots of different enzymes to transcribe DNA into messenger RNA and all that. What this virus does is it infects the cell and it reverses this process using reverse transcriptase. That's how it makes its viral DNA, by reversing the normal transcription process with this special enzyme. So a great example of a retrovirus is the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Now, what this does is it infects helper T cells, which are cells of the immune system that usually attack and kill uh, infections. So what happens then is it leads to a weakened immune system, and possibly if your T cell count gets low enough, you will end up with AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now, how does HIV transmit itself? It's all in bodily fluids that come into contact with mucous membranes uh, of damaged tissue, or if it's injected directly in the bloodstream. So HIV transmission is through blood, semen, preseminal fluid, rectal fluid, vaginal fluid, and breast milk. So all of those, those types of bodily fluids can transmit HIV. So very, very dangerous there. Uh, just a quick look at a couple of other different types of viruses and, and where they uh, can uh, infect you. Chickenpox is a virus, herpes, HPV, mononucleosis, sometimes called mono, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, shingles, which is a very similar virus to uh, chickenpox, um, and then even rabies is a virus as well. So lots of different viruses, different ways that they can transmit and get into your body.